From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 47, recorded on September 5th, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we are on part three of a series of columns on Project 2025 versus the public's health. Today is the NIH. So remind us, Paul, what is Project 2025? So Project 2025 is kind of a conservative manifesto for how government agencies will be handled um, should we have a Republican president beginning in January of next year. And, and among those agencies, we've talked about the CDC, the FDA, and NIH, three federal agencies that deal with public health, right? That's right. So the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, oh boy, I've had a long association with NIH, and so have you. What is the NIH, and what does it do? So the National Institutes of Health is a, um, and it's institutes, so more than one institute, but it, 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 and it includes National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which uh, Dr. Tony Fauci headed. Um, it looks at studies, studies of a variety of infectious diseases, as well as other issues, to do basic science research that ends up being often very important in the in the medical products that we have, and and it's been for decades been an important funder of a basic science research that has helped us live longer, better lives. And so the NIH funds external research, like laboratories at your place and, and mine, but they also fund, they do research at the NIH campus, right? That's right. So both in-house and out-of-house research. But I was funded by, for more than 25 years, by NIH, and that allowed us to do the basic science studies that ended up being uh, a rotavirus vaccine. And I was funded for 40 years to work on various enteroviruses, like poliovirus, I didn't make any vaccines, but I think we made some basic science advances nonetheless. So it's, for me, I wouldn't have had a research career without the NIH, and many other people probably would say the same thing. Okay, now in this document, they claim that scientific research is controlled by a few insiders at NIH, and I wonder if you could Tell us whether that's correct or not. Right. So if you don't mind, let me, let me sort of read everything that they said, because it was sure. a frightening few sentences. This from Project 2025. Funding for scientific research should not be controlled by a small group of highly paid and unaccountable insiders at the NIH, many of whom stay in power for decades. The NIH monopoly on directing research should be broken. More recently, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases Anthony Fauci's division of the NIH owns half of the patent for the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, and several NIH employees receive annual royalties for Moderna vaccine sales. That would be the same experimental mRNA vaccine that the CDC now wants to force on children who are at little to no risk from COVID, um, but at great risk from public health officials. So this sort of lets you know where they're coming from. So many things in there. Okay. <laughs> but but note. These are claims without data. They never say, what, what's the data that support this? Uh, in my experience, and, and I'm sure yours as well, uh, research isn't controlled by a few individuals at NIH. Isn't that correct? Not at all. I mean, that's really the beauty of basic science research. You get to wander. Uh, you know, you get to sort of answer questions that you're interested in that may or may not be relative to a product. And, and sometimes that wandering ends up being a product. I mean, you look at the Curler and Milstein experiments on somatic cell hybridization. They weren't trying to make monoclonal antibodies that would become a product, but it, it worked out that way. I mean, we, 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 um, need to be able to wander in science to answer questions that are interesting to us because in the end, um, it will be one grain of sand on the beach of scientific knowledge that ultimately helps us um, have better lives. Now, I was funded by the extramural program all those years, and my money came from NIAD, where Dr. Fauci was the, the chair. 
And not once <laughs> did he have any role in the funds that I received. I received funds because I wrote a proposal. It was reviewed by a study section of 20 people. They gave it a score, and then it's automatically funded or not. So there's no one person that has any role in that. So I, I just don't know where that claim is coming from. It's competitive, and, and you're being reviewed by experts in, in the field who will rank your grant uh, alongside other grants. It's a, it's a meritorious process, and it has certainly worked well and served us well over the years. And we should point out that also the, the internal research is also competitive. You have to write proposals, and they're reviewed by committees uh, to determine whether you get funded as well. Right. Reviewed by external committees. It works that way at the, at the NIH. It works that way with the research that's done at the FDA, too. It has external committees that review that research to see whether or not progress has been reasonable. And if you look over the years at the research that has come out of NIH-funded projects, it's amazing. And not just vaccines, but basic technologies that have advanced all of science. So really, the NIH is the beacon for research in the U.S., isn't it? Very much so. And it, it's a model really for every other country in this world, really. I think it's a, it's been an amazingly successful model. Now, they... Uh, you in your statement you read that the the, the report claims that NIAID owns half of the, the the Moderna mRNA vaccine patent. So I think that's correct, right? Right. So so um, NIH researchers Barney Graham and Kizmekia Corbett and others were uh, started working on a MERS vaccine, right? So MERS was the uh, coronavirus, the pandemic coronavirus that raised its head in 2012 out of the, the Middle East and then spread across the world, caused thousands of cases and, and hundreds of deaths. And um, so they were working on that vaccine, but that um, disease kind of uh, uh, petered out in a sense. But nonetheless, because they'd done that work, they were in a position then that when SARS-CoV-2 raised its head in 2019, they could very quickly start to make a, what ended up being um, the um, mRNA-1273 vaccine, which was Moderna's vaccine. So they basically, you know, created that strain that then was uh, the production of which was done by Moderna. But you're right, they own the patent because the way it works is that companies um, are loath to uh, pursue a product that is where the technology is not protected or said another way that's not patented. So yes, they own the patent. And as a consequence, they, they probably uh, got a small percentage of of that uh, the the um, the revenues from from that vaccine. Although typically the way it works is that the the um, the hospital or the research institute will sell out the, the patent, and then they will they will get the large part of it, and then a small much smaller part of that would go to the inventor. But yes, sure. But this is seen as evil by um, people who who would argue that that the only reason that the NIH, for example, was behind this vaccine was because you know they profited from it, and that's that was sort of the the, the cry of the anti-vaccine activists. See, of course they're gonna they're gonna promote this, or of course Dr. Fauci is gonna promote this because NIH made money off of it. But that's not why they do it. That's not why researchers do that. They do it because they're they're trying to advance public health. I don't think anybody goes into basic science research and thinks, boy, if I can just do this, I can make a lot of money and retire. At least nobody in their right mind does that. Also, we didn't know if the vaccines were going to work at the beginning, right? Exactly. There's no guarantee that any money would come from them. Now, as far as I understand, the bulk of the patent income goes back into NIH and it's used for research, correct? Exactly right. And that's, that's just the same way at our hospital. I mean, when you know we created the vaccine that became uh, Rotatech, I mean, 90% of the, 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 uh, the, the money that came from selling out that patent all went back into Children's Hospital, all went back into research for how to make children's lives better. The system works well. And we, a small amount also goes to the inventors, as you've just mentioned, a few of them. And NIH does not disclose uh, what goes to the inventors, and probably that's that's a reasonable idea. Um, but I, I, I do note that Dr. Fauci had a recent testimony before Congress was asked how much money he has made. And he said, oh, about $120 over the, all the years I've been here <laughs> from patent income. So this idea that he, that people are becoming billionaires is just wrong. Right. But we, you know, we, we, we'd like to see evildoers where there's just a real conspiracy theory sense in this country. We want to believe that there are people behind the curtain who we don't see that mean to do us harm. Although here you had an mRNA vaccine by Moderna that with, along with Pfizer's vaccine probably saved 3 million lives in this country. That's pretty impressive that these, that some of these investigators uh, were financially compensated for that. Probably not in a major way, but in some way. 
that's okay. This idea of receiving patent income from work is very widespread, not just NIH, but industry, right? If you are working in industry, you can have patent income, but also if you're collaborating, you may have patent income. It's a way of, of uh, rewarding good work, right? Sure. And although it's interesting, I think many people will think it's incentivizing. It isn't really that incentivizing for the basic science researcher, because that's not why you do it. You, your, your incentive is to try and be able to get yeah. your papers published, be able to get your grants funded so that you can, you know, go from one year to the next to the next to the next. I don't think I don't think I know any scientist who goes <laughs> into basic science and thinks, boy, if I can just figure out which of these two viral surface proteins, those <laughs> neutralizing antibodies, I can be rich beyond my wildest dreams. No one in their right mind thinks that way. Many years ago, my lab developed transgenic mice susceptible to polio virus, and the university wanted to patent it. And I said, no, 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 I want everyone to be able to use these. And they said, no, no, you can't, we have to patent. So it went through a very costly and lengthy process, and I never made a penny off of any of it, which is fine, but it restricted access to people. And I thought, that's not what science is about. Anything that restricts access, access to a reagent that you make isn't appropriate. Right. Now, they have the audacity to say that children are at little to no risk from COVID. I don't know how anyone can say that. All you have to do is look online and you can see um, the, the numbers. So why is that completely false? Right. So, so in the U.S., about 1,700 children, meaning people less than 18 years of age, have died from this virus. That's that's little or no risk. That's okay. 1,700 deaths is okay. I think it's just a, a blatantly false statement and verifiably false statement. And finally, unlike the first two uh, parts of CDC and FDA where they had a comment on, they don't actually offer a solution to this supposed problem. Uh, maybe because there isn't a problem. <laughs> No, there isn't a problem. There's the opposite of a problem. I mean, if you look at w w mRNA, by the way, it, and everybody now th knows the term mRNA or messenger RNA, <laughs> that actually has been used in the past as an adjuvant for a rabies vaccine, for example. But the problem with mRNA is it's too inflammatory, and it's not the kind of inflammation that helps. Um, it's the kind of inflammation that needs to be tamed if you're going to have a good adaptive immune response to the protein you're interested in. And so Drew Weissman and Katie Carrico at the University of Pennsylvania um, began their collaboration in 1997. They were funded pretty much exclusively by the National Institutes of Health. And because of that, they they were able to essentially substitute a nucleoside uh, analog, um, pseudouridine for uracil, that ultimately resulted in a, a, a much safer uh, mRNA vaccine and better mRNA vaccine, for which they both won the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine from money that had been provided by NIH. Now, when, when that money was provided, I don't think anybody thought, okay, well, this is great. We'll, 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 we'll provide this money. And then, you know, like 20 years from now, it's going to be a value because this virus that we don't know about is going to be coming <laughs> to the United States. So it's, it's, it's because you have that, 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 uh, that bedrock, you know, that area under the, the tip of the iceberg to have all that information, we were able to respond quickly and effectively to this vaccine, to this, uh, to this, the threat of this virus because we had done this kind of research. And it's not appreciated. I really don't think people appreciate in the general public how much basic science research needs to be done before you're able to, you're able to launch a successful vaccine campaigns. And I think many people feel the, the mRNA vaccines are experimental, they're dangerous, they have bad side effects, which all of which is not correct. Yet I think that taints uh, the public's view and many people don't want them. They'd rather have uh, a protein-based vaccine, for example. But this technology ha could have wider ranging applications, right? Not, not just not for vaccine, for, for, for infectious diseases, but for cancer. But you're right, yes. you use the term experimental in this. Experimental, I mean, this is probably one of the best studies vaccines in, in the history of the world. It's been given to billions of people. It's not experimental anymore. All right, we'll put a link to the column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.